Good morning. Oh, good morning. Thank you all. Well, thank you. Welcome this morning. You know, sometimes I think I don't get all the respect I deserve, and it's part of my fault out of my own great humility. I don't always tout my full credentials. I've never mentioned this in a book. I, I, I haven't mentioned it here in a sermon, but you should know this about me. I actually attended Harvard Business School. I did. Now, for the sake of honesty, I wasn't actually a student, and I didn't get a degree, but I was there for an entire day. Three classes, and they're long classes. All y'all laugh, but that's probably longer than you've been to Harvard Business School. Of course, if I graduated from Harvard Law School, I probably wouldn't use the phrase all y'all, but, but I didn't. I was just there. But one of the challenges of going to business school, when you haven't read the books, and when you haven't studied and you're not in the program, you don't understand what he's saying. I mean, the professors can be saying these incredibly smart things and they'd go right over my head. There's a discussion about the difference between ROI and ROE. Now, business people know this. Camille probably knows this. Return on investment or return on equity. And so I asked my son after, what's the difference? And Graham says, well, ROI means the spend on a project is going to be worth it. ROE means the profit a business makes based on all the equity, which sounds exactly to me like ROI. But if you're in the know, apparently it's not. Or they throw out acronyms like LIFO and FIFO. This is not naming their pets. I think these are great names for poodles, but actually it means last in, first out, first in, first out. And then I had to understand that a B2B isn't a quaint Victorian house where you get a nice night of sleep and a hot breakfast in the morning. It refers to business to business, which isn't to be confused with B2C, which is business to consumer, which my son also explained is different than DTC, which is direct to consumer. I said, what's the difference between business to consumer and direct to consumer? He goes, well, you're going through a business to reach the consumer or you're going direct to the consumer, which again, sounds to me like exactly the same thing but not if you've been to business school. And then as a very literal-minded English major, I was a little surprised to realize that gross profit isn't disgusting. It's actually a really good thing. So, so just as business people, they know this is their second language, but it sounds like gobbledygook to us outsiders. So the Apostle Paul would tell us that the things of the Spirit... The wisdom of God that can become so familiar to us can sound like gobbledygook to outsiders. But when we understand this language, it will change the entire course of our life. Let me go back a little bit. We've been in a series on 1 Corinthians, and in the first chapter, it's basically summarized by Paul being upset because a number of false teachers are leading the Corinthian church astray because it's gifted believers that are pulling them away from their devotion to Christ. And Paul is so appalled because what's happening is these Corinthian believers are infusing the church with the values of the world. They care about worldly influence. They care about great rhetoric, impressive speech, social standing, personality, cults. And Paul says, that's not what we're about at all. It's never been what Jesus' is church about. It's never what Jesus' is church will be about. And if you want to summarize chapter 1, you could just go to chapter 131. When Paul says, let the one who boasts boasts in the Lord. Because that's what we're about. And then in chapter two, the first five verses, right before we are, start our passage, Paul's basically saying this. You can base your life on worldly wisdom and, and, and worldly power, or, or I'm sorry, worldly wisdom or God's power. Wh which one are you gonna follow? Worldly wisdom or God's power? And then he starts here in verse six, where he's gonna say, I don't really have a problem with power per se, or wisdom per se, I have a problem with the kind of world wisdom that the world values. Now, a lot of this might sound to some of you, okay, fine, this is great in the first century. I'm not in Corinth. We don't have all these issues. Why does this impact me? If we don't understand what Paul's about to tell us in verses six through 10, I believe his concern is that we will settle for a life of second best. We'll have spent our entire lives running the wrong race, climbing the wrong mountain, playing the wrong game. And this is a huge wake-up call by Paul. I don't want you to do that. 
I want you to focus on what matters most. And that's what he's calling us to because it will change our lives. So let's pray toward that end. Lord, I thank you for your clear word given through your servant, Paul. I just pray your spirit would come and make your word alive, that we could understand it, that we could open up our hearts to it, that we might be transformed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're gonna begin in 1 Corinthians 2, beginning with verse six, and here's what Paul says. Yet, among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Remember, you just talked down the wisdom of the world. Although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. He goes, we're not stupid. We have this wisdom. It's just a very different wisdom than the world values. And here's what's so key in this verse. He says, the wisdom of this age and the rulers of this age are doomed to pass away. It's so key. He says, they reign now. They're famous now. They seem to have all the power. When you look around, he goes, but they're going down. They won't end up reigning. They're just a matter of fashion that goes in and out. My wife came with me here almost 11 years ago now to Texas from the Pacific Northwest. And she's never been as into avant-garde fashions. It just breaks. But she, she likes to look great. I think she always looks great. But sometimes she'll just look and see what women in the Bible studies are wearing. And just kind of wait. Say, yeah, I, I like it. I, I think that looks nice. And, and not too long ago, she kept seeing these cropped frayed jeans, which between you, I don't have a clue what cropped frayed jeans are. If you're wearing them, my wife thinks they look great, right? So, so good on you. But she's just describing them to me. And, and she said, I, I think I'll go get a pair. So she went to a store where you'd think they'd have them, and they didn't have any. And she asked the saleswoman, I was looking for these crop frayed jeans. And she said, yeah, they were really big last year. I think they're kind of going out now. But then there's another very fashionable store where they said, oh, no, we just got a lot in. These things are really booming. So even stores disagree about what's in fashion. I mean, at one point, everybody has to wear them, and then nobody's wearing them, and then some people are wearing them. <laughs> Paul's saying the wisdom of this age and the rulers of this age, they're like fashion. Now, they might last longer than a year, like fashion does. But this is so key. From the perspective of eternity, that's how temporary they are. They don't matter. They don't last. Which means, young people, man, if I could say anything for you starting out your life, when you're getting out there and you're thrilled because you're experiencing life, you're on your own, you're making it, you've got your business, you've got everything going, I just want to say this. If you live, this is what Paul would say to you. If you live to seek favor with the world, what Paul is saying is that you're hitching your wagon to the losing side. It's going down, he says. Don't be enamored with it. What do I mean by the world? In biblical language, the world is simply this. Anything that's in rebellion against God. That's how the Bible defines the world, as systems that are in rebellion against God. Now, to understand the passage, you need to understand the context, what's going on in Corinth at this time. Paul wrote this in about 52 AD. And when Paul wrote this, and he's going out to these other countries, you just need to know, the Christian church was a tiny, tiny, tiny sect. In fact, when he wrote to Romans, this magisterial letter that we just think is so brilliant and so powerful, Paul was writing to a few dozen believers. There are probably at least three dozen believers in Rome, but certainly less than 100. It was a small church. And when he's writing to Corinth, huh, I want to put things in perspective. In Corinth, there were more temple prostitutes than there were Christians. So Paul's writing to this tiny group. Everywhere they look, in Rome, in Corinth, the government, the media, the entertainment, all of the powers of the society were hostile to the message of Jesus Christ. They thought they were on the absolute bottom. And it wasn't just the secular authorities, it was the religious authorities. If you go back to Jerusalem, out of which Christianity sprang, at the time when Paul was writing, the Sadducees were the sect of Jews that ruled the religious world. They were in control of the temple, they were overseeing the Sanhedrin. I mean, they were in charge. Now, Paul's writing in 52 AD. In 70 AD, Jerusalem is sacked. The temple is demolished. And you don't see this very often in history. The Sadducees disappear. 
They literally cease to exist. Other sects of Judaism made it. The Sadducees, they're gone, never to rise again. But if you were to go back to 52 AD when Paul wrote this, and you were to say, who do you think in 2021 will rule in this world? The Roman Empire, the Sadducees in Jerusalem, the few dozen followers of Jesus Christ. Only one man in a million would say, Jesus, that man was Paul, and that man was right, and what was true 2,000 years ago is true today. Even it seemed like the powers are arrayed against God's church, Paul is saying, they're going down as Jesus is lifted up, and so he wants them to understand what God's about. So he says in verse seven, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God. Now, secret just means spiritual. I'm gonna be back here next week. I hope you'll come, because it's really part two of this sermon. Paul's gonna get into what's the difference of the natural person and the spiritual person, the quality of life of a believer moved by the spirit. It's a great concept. We don't have time to get into it, but that's what he means by secret. By hidden, he doesn't mean it's no longer understood. We're gonna find out, verses nine and 10, it's clearly understood. What he means by hidden is that God has been unrolling the events throughout all of history, and now through the Spirit, we're finally seeing what has been happening. And you know what? One of the things that makes me so confident as a believer and dispels any possible doubts more than anything else, when I read through the Bible and I just see how God knew it and he just unrolled the events like this master storyteller, just this last week I was reading through Isaiah And it came across Isaiah 52. It's a very familiar passage. Probably all of you have read it. And it's the picture of Jesus being sacrificed and punished for our sins. It's like 700 years. The Jews couldn't have understood what this is all about. It didn't make sense. They didn't know Jesus at that time. But we look back and it's amazing. He was pierced side, hands, feet, For our rebellion. He was crushed. For our sins. 700 years before. What does that even mean? He was beaten. How how did they know? So that we could be whole. They whipped him. So that we could be healed. This is the message of the gospel. 700 years before Jesus comes in flesh, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him sins of us all. And Paul saw God as his master writer who's unfurled this scroll and he says, ta-da, here it is. All of the ages have waited for this unveiling. It's like a dad on Christmas. He's hidden the present, but now it's being unwrapped. The bow is off and he said, look at this. And I know we get into Christianese and we know a lot, I have a lot of people that just come. So if you're newer here, when somebody says the gospel, you don't know what that means. I just want to give you a quick definition. This is what Paul says is the wisdom of God. That God is the creator. That's why we are called to worship him. It's not because he's more powerful than us or has a hot basement he'll put us into if we don't obey. He's not a tyrant. He's the rightful creator. He created this world for our glory. But we sin. We, we rebelled against him. Every one of us have done that. So God had a plan. He created a family out of nothing, this infertile couple, well past childbearing age, made a nation out of them called Israel and said out of this nation would come a Messiah who would save not just that nation but the Gentiles, that is all non-Jews as well. That Messiah came 2,000 years ago. His name was Jesus, born in the flesh, died on the cross, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and that's the only way our rebellion and sin can be removed by trusting in God's grace. And when we trust in God's grace, we not only have a new life qualitative in this life, we'll get into that next week, but eternal glory that is unparalleled that Paul wants them to see today. In a shorter phrase, the wisdom of God is this. It means the world has started over again with the death of Jesus, 
the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, and the sending of the Holy Spirit. The old order still seems like they're in charge. It still seems like everybody is against this, but their reign is over. Their death has already been declared. Which means young people, middle-aged who need a life reset, certainly senior citizens while there is still time. Paul is calling Corinth to, what Paul is calling us to, you must place a bet. You have to make a choice. You can bet on God's unfolding plan. I believe that to be true. I'm going to live as if it's true. Or you place your bet on the world. I'm going to seek after what the world values. I'm going to seek after what the world favors. I'm going to go by worldly wisdom. Not to choose God is to choose the world. You can't be neutral because God is the rightful ruler. So not to acknowledge that is to oppose him. Not to be for God is to be against God. That's the wisdom that Paul is talking about. And if you place the wrong bet, I hope you don't. Because if you do... The second half of verse seven tells us what you'll miss. Paul says this, this wisdom which God decreed before the ages for, read that next word with me, our glory, our glory. See, you first read, the, you don't expect that word are there. But, but here's what's going on. People who cooperate with the anti-God forces think that's where safety is, that's where security, that's success, that's fame. And Paul says, no, actually, you're hitching your wagon to the losing side, trading eternal glory by following God for earthly fame would be like Prince William giving up all rights to his kingdom and inheritance for a stick of gum. I mean, it's so absurd. Charles says to William, why would you do that? Dad is hubba bubba, cherry red, juicy, good gum. I mean, it, William would never do that. And Paul says, I don't believe any human if they could know what's going on would give up this eternal glory that God has revealed to us for what people still live by. You see, in chapter one, Paul admits most of those God calls, not all, but most of them, were a bunch of nobodies. We were. But now he's saying, but we become somebodies when we hitch our glory to his. Our glory is a reflected glory. When we live for him, his glory becomes ours. But when we live for our glory, we may think we're somebody, but we're going to end up being the nobodies. Now let me back up. Not only does Corinth and 52 matter, the author of this book matters. Why is it important that Paul is writing this? Not Peter, not John, James, Jude, Matthew, Luke. Godly men, but they didn't write this. Why does that matter? We're going to find out in 2 Corinthians that Paul went to what he calls the third heaven. What he's referring to there is life as it will be for eternity. How it is after we die, that dimension of existence, Paul had been there. He goes, I don't know if it was a vision. I don't know if I was really there. It was so real. I, I couldn't tell you. He goes, but I've been there. And having come back to that, to this world, Paul says, oh man, you have no idea what this world values. It, it doesn't count. It, it doesn't compare. And he's saying to the Corinthian church, he says to us, I'm pleading with you. It is so much better. It's so much glorious. Don't settle for less. I've seen it. I've seen this internal glory. God has let me see it. Don't settle for less. If you live by the power of this world, you're settling for less. If you're just trying to amass worldly wealth instead of eternal wealth, you're settling for less. If you're trying to seek favor with those who live by the wrong values because they've never seen what I've seen, Paul says you're settling for less. This is a passionate man saying, I, I don't want you to do this because he knows others have already done it. He says in verse eight, none of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had... It would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Jesus was here in the flesh, but not in the package, the powers that be expected. So they killed him. 
They killed the man who came to save them. Their ignorance led to deicide, killing God. This is what you've got to understand. I want young people to understand this as well. Spiritual ignorance makes powerful people in the world hate the things of Christ. Paul would say it's spiritual ignorance that makes powerful people in the world hate the things of Christ. It's repeated throughout scripture. Last month I was reading through Proverbs. I tweeted out this. We can seek to live a life that honors God or seek to be liked by others, but we can't seek both. Why? Proverbs 29, 27, the wicked detest the upright. The wicked detest the upright. They hate what we do. Why? Because they hate the things of Christ. And yet how often does the church seem obsessed instead of honoring God with trying to make the world like us? And Paul is saying, they crucified Christ. You expect them to give you a back rub? Not if you're preaching the truth of Christ. I'm not saying be obnoxious. I'm not saying be crucified for our own foolishness or rashness where we don't mirror Christ. But if we've got this false sense that we just are gonna find a way to find favor with the world, Paul would say it's just not true that it's the nature of the world to be against us. Just as he said, they killed Jesus physically, crucified him physically, so today they wanna crucify Jesus spiritually. I remember when my son was graduating from high school, I was on the organizing committee for the baccalaureate, which has always been a Christian church service, voluntary for people to come to. You have a sermon, you pray over the graduates, you bless them, and then they go to their real graduation. Now, I don't know if they have these wars down here in Texas, but up in the Pacific Northwest, in the People's Republic of Seattle, they were trying to make this Christian service as secular as possible, and we're beating heads, butting heads against each other, until finally this woman, one of the powers that be, says, fine, we'll let you say God, but I don't want to hear the J word referring to Jesus. See, they'll give you religion, In fact, why does so often academia and the media support other religions? We don't want to fight against them, but Christianity, they're waiting to blame because it's only Jesus who stands against the powers of this world. They may not understand why they have such antipathy or passion against them, but in their heart of hearts, they know he stands for God. And if they're not with God, he stands against them. Paul says, we can know that if we've read the book, if we've enrolled in the program, if we're not just visiting, he says in verses nine and 10, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, that's what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the spirit, for the spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Paul says, without God, we can't know this. We'll get into that more next week. But with the spirit, we can. I, I'm, I'm, like, I'm not trying to just pick on young people, but I, I'm just trying to defend you spiritually. Here's the thing. When talk show hosts mock Jesus and faith in Jesus, when your professors ridicule you, you know what Paul would say? They don't know what they're talking about. That's why they ridiculed Jesus. They're blind. They don't even understand what they're making fun of. It was true 2,000 years ago. It's true in 2021. And so when somebody is mocking Jesus and they don't have the spirit of God, my question is, have you ever been to heaven? And they'd look at me like I'm crazy. No, okay. I'm gonna go with the one who has. Because I believe this is true. I believe every word is true. I believe Paul saw heaven. I believe Jesus rose from the dead. I'm going to base my life on this truth, not the wisdom of the world. There's a little baby appropriately named Christian. I love this. Some things you can't just make happen. He was born with some eye problems. His parents got him his first pair of glasses. And it's a parable of all I'm saying. Let's look at little Christian. 
We got the baby's first pair of glasses. Okay. Oh. He already hates it. Christian. Christian. Open your eyes, buddy. Hi. 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 Hi, Hi Munchkin. <laughs> <laughs> Paul would say that's the hidden secret wisdom of God. That can't be true. It's no, no, I don't want to. Whoa. Paul said, I want you to go, whoa. I want you to be caught up with the things of God. So what does all this mean? Let me just summarize it to close. As Christians, there's a difference between the wisdom of this age and the wisdom of the age to come. They not, only don't, they not only don't agree with each other, they are at war with each other because the wisdom of this age is marked, defined by its rebellion against Jesus. But Paul says that wisdom, that power is coming to an end. And if you don't understand this, you're like a scientist who thinks the earth is flat. The things that matter, you think matter, don't matter. The things that you think don't matter are first importance. We just have a different orientation. A couple years back, after I did a focus on the family program, it was in the summer, Lisa said, before we rush back to Houston, there's this great place, a couple hours outside of Colorado Springs. There's these hot springs. She says, let's go there. So we did. It's a beautiful place to relax. They have like eight or nine natural hot springs. In one of these springs, I'm guessing it was a bachelorette party, because there were probably eight to ten young women, I'd say mid-30s. And they climbed into the pool where we were and they're just talking away. And it was amazing because they were talking about the doctors they see to try to look younger than 35, although 35 looks young to me, how much money they pay, the new treatments. One of them even said, oh, all the Kardashians are doing this. After about five minutes of this, Lisa kind of says, can we go to another pool? I go, yeah, let's go to another pool. And we get out and she says, does it bug you that I'm just not as into that? And at the time I was reading William Law, one of my favorite spiritual writers, wrote in the 18th century, he was an Anglican. And he said, Christians are those who pursue things like patience and gentleness and humility and love and forgiveness with, this is key, the same intensity that the world pursues, fame, worldly achievements, beauty, and wealth. And when you look at most people, those are the big four, right? We pursue wealth. We want that retirement number. We want to be looked at as 20 years younger than we are. We want these worldly achievements. And we want to be famous. And he says, that's passing away. That's worldly wisdom. We're focused on becoming more like Christ. We have entirely different values. Because then the focus isn't on drawing attention to us. It's drawing attention to him. Because our glory is rooted in in his glory. So we live not for ourselves, but for him. Decades ago, I worked in an office setting with perhaps the most toxic person I've ever known. He was bitter, he was cruel, he would humiliate people right where they were most embarrassed. He would sit, set all these stupid fights in the office, who got to open the mail, all of these things that didn't matter. When he was finally fired, because there's gonna be, everybody else was gonna be gone. I'm not proud of this, but the whole office had a party. Whew, we're done. But when I was pushing back before he was fired, because, you know, it's just human pride in nature, I just didn't wanna give in, because I just don't like bullies, I don't like what they're doing. But I was praying about it one time, and I felt like God saying, Gary, He's fighting over a pile of cow manure. Let him have it. And I laughed. I mean, in prayer, God doesn't usually sound like that, right? And maybe, but it's just, I just was laughing. Was, you know what? You're right. It just doesn't matter because you know what happens if you fight for a pile of cow manure and you win? You smell like cow manure. You smell like vanity. You smell like greed. You smell like selfish ambition. You smell like pride. All of those things. And Paul says, no, 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 no. That's not us. When we get to 2 Corinthians, maybe it's 20, 23, I don't know. But when we get there, there's this beautiful passage where Paul says, we're to be, some of you are ahead of me, the aroma of Christ. We don't want to smell like cow manure of the world. We want to smell like Christ. But here's the thing, we'll never be the aroma of Christ, if we don't value 
the aroma of Christ. And we can't value the aroma of Christ if we're fighting over piles of cow manure. So here's where Paul brings us to a decision. Where will you place your bet? On the glory of Christ or the wisdom of this age and the powers of this world? To me, those who reject Jesus are just like those that Isaiah ridicules. 2,700 years ago, Isaiah said, you know what some of you do? You go out in the forest, you cut down a tree, half of it goes into the fire to cook your food, the other half, you carve it up, you decorate it, you paint it, you bow down and worship it. He goes, how stupid can you be? How can this piece of wood save you? But see, Paul would say the idols of 2021 are no less stupid. Isaiah would say the idols of 2021 are no less stupid than people that did that almost 3,000 years ago. Because whether your idols cost $100 billion, whether your idols have 100 million fans, if they're not Jesus, they're going down. Because Jesus is going up. Because I firmly believe, and I'm betting my life on it, and I hope you'll bet yours. I believe everybody in this room one day will agree with this. Maybe a thousand years from now, but the day will come when every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everybody realizes he wins. He has won. And Paul says, base your life on that. So if he was at Harvard Business School today, here's what he would say. Don't trade eternal glory for earthly glory. Because the ROI at the EOD is tremendous GP. The return on investment at the end of the day is tremendous gross profit. And from my vast experience at Harvard Business School, I know gross profit, it's a good thing. It'll be a good thing for you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the times that your word can just stop us Search our hearts, our minds, our focus, because you are a God of grace and kindness that want us to be able to be redirected by your spirit. This is not to condemn anyone. It's to invite everyone to eternal glory. And I pray you'd release your grace right now to do just that. That those that are on the wrong path would respond to your spirit. They would say, I've been living for myself. I don't want to do that. Lord, call those that you would have come to know this eternal life, to know a life of worshiping Jesus.